Good morning, Terry Harden, uh, Disney's legendary Imagineer, international trademarked artist and speaker. And I've been in Ghostbusters, Men in Black, all kinds of fool, fun, cool stuff. Basically, I'm a pop icon. Uh, Google me if you want under Terry Harden, but stand back. There's a lot of pages when you do that. But anyway, if you're new, welcome. And if you're joining us again, welcome back. And if you're joining us after this live video, uh, have a good time. What you're going to see in this channel is my very, very much like Terry TV. Welcome to Terry TV. Uh, the reason I call it Terry TV is because we I cover a lot of subjects, whatever is going through my head. So please subscribe if you're okay with my freeway brain. A lot of times I will talk about things that uh, will help you in your life. Uh, you can say, how does this help me in my life? You know, by simply going over and uh, uh, mentioning in the comments, you can ask anything. It can be about anything with the exception of sports. I'm not really a sports person. Um, um, everyone around me is my father, my cousin, my husband. No, me and my husband are all about films. And if you want to talk about films, this is what I love. And films is what brings Terry TV to the table today. Films that surprise you. Okay. I thought I'd talk about this today because I wasn't feeling well over the weekend. So Terry was feeling kind of, um, yeah. And, uh, uh, I was feeling kind of, kind of blah and I can't explain why. Um, I went to do a bingo on Saturday with my chalk walk team. And by the way, if you're interested in joining my chalk walk team or you're interested in donating, I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to do an opportunity drawing here for you to donate to chalk and, uh, uh, reach out to me if you want to. And, um, this is fine. And, uh, uh, give me the opportunity to, uh, uh, just, I want, I want to raise money for children hospital. Excuse me. I'm just looking for something here. There we go. I've got it. All right. Just trying to trigger my mind based on the topic today. Got a little distracted. This is also the deal. Okay. So I'm talking about movies that surprise you. Wasn't feeling well yesterday. My husband pulls up. A uh, violent night, violent night, unholy night. Uh, this stars uh, David Harbour. And David Harbour is really well known for Stranger Things. And I love the series Stranger Things. I can't get enough. I think even if some people feel that some of the seasons of Stranger Things aren't great, I don't care. It has... Several people in it that I absolutely adore, one of them being David Harbour. I just think the man is amazing. I love the uh, relationship he has with uh, uh, the lead actress, you see? And I look at it, is it Winona? Anyway, doesn't matter. You'll tell me because you guys all know. Post it in a comment. He just pops out in every season. For some reason, he really shines. And it's just an acting chops thing. I expect it of, I think it's Winona Ryder. Uh, I, I expect it of her. And she really knocks it out of the park. If I have the wrong actress, fix it. Fix it for me, please. Uh, but anyway, um, I expect her to be great. But him, I hadn't seen him in many things. And I really, really love this actor. I've become like, I, I like him so much that when I saw his picture in um, Violet Night, it looked like a slasher film to me. And I just didn't want to see it when it came out. I was like, I don't want to see him go dark. I could understand that many actors, being an actress myself, you're always trying to stretch yourself. So sometimes what you'll do is you'll take a, an opposite character. So in this one, in Stranger Things, he's a he's a vulnerable character. He's a kind character. He's a neutral character. And he's a tough character in Stranger Things. And uh, I just didn't want David to be this uh, killer. 
I just was afraid he was going to be this slasher. The The picture was scary. Um, I didn't read what it was about. I just avoided it. It was on buses. You may remember it was everywhere. And I just didn't want to happen. Here's one of the reasons that I'm a little bit, you know, I was a little bit. E the bottom line is this movie surprised me. Let me let me just drop the other shoe. The bottom line is that it it really blew me away. Uh, because this movie was nothing like I expected. But before I get to that, let me tell you why I'm a little nervous. I loved a um, series called Dexter about a serial killer who was also a um, um, investigative, what is it, pathologist? Anyway, he was in a CSI position, but he was the one that, that you know, investigated the bodies and everything. But it turns out he's a serial killer on the side. It's really a wild dynamic. It was so impressive. Um, season one, I absolutely fell in love with the character and fell in love with the premises. But then in season two, we had John Lithgow playing one of the most terrifying characters I've ever seen John Lithgow play in his life. It was so terrifying and so frightening. He was scarier than Dexter. And as a result, it became so jarring that his benevolent, fun, upbeat characters that we had seen him in like Forrest Gump and other characters that he's done that we've fallen in love with. There were many um, contracts that he had like on Turner Classic, mo Classic Movies. He was going to be that Sunday fun day summer where he was going to be the host of that. And they pulled it after seeing the second season of Dexter because it was a very adverse feeling after we saw that. It was awful. I could never, and I know why Lithgow did it. It was to show people he's not always the good guy. He can also play bad guys. And he's very, very good. In fact, he's pulled the, the, the people that are casting him now. They're kind of pulling back a little bit. If you've ever seen The Accountant, um, it's a great movie. And he plays a character that's kind of neutral, not so evil. But in Dexter, he was so scary that uh, it made people, he could not play that nice Sunday fun day person because he, uh, had done this really scary, scary character. And that's a shame because if you remember, if we go all the way back in film or television, and I love film and television, it's uh, as an actress, which I don't act a lot because I have such a unique look and I'm kids, I'm what you call under five. So unless I get a co-starring role, uh, I'm too unusual to be an under five, under five translation is someone that leads you from lead actor A over to lead actor B without you stopping the camera. Okay, so like a secretary, I could be the receptionist. Let's say you had me in the receptionist seat at something in, in, in a series that you liked. And the look makes the camera stop because I have an unusual look. And this is very, my agent made this very clear to me, so, as did the casting directors. They are looking for someone a little more uh, uh, average. And I don't mean that in a mean way. I mean that in a good way. A person that when you walk in, you see 10 or 20 of you because you're dark hair or you're blonde with blue eyes and you're 18 or 22 ish. Okay. Um, you can be like the receptionist in, uh, something's got to give. Yes. Where, uh, the woman who plays that also plays the wife in Dexter, but she could be any actress. Okay. Because she's kind of classic blonde hair, blue eyes. That's what people look for in an under five. This is a good thing for you. Not a bad thing for you. Um, for me, it's a challenge. It's not even a bad thing for me because in, when I do get to play characters on television as myself, I'm saying as myself, as a puppeteer, it's all different. Um, but as myself, if I get to play, it's with people who are unusual to begin with, like James Woods. I did two of his series before it ended. I played a couple characters in his series because he didn't. He he was eclectic enough that going from me to him no big deal, right? Because James Wedge is so unique. So nothing wrong with who you are. It's just, where do you fit? 
It's like when an actor or acting coach tells you, you can't say you can play everything because in theater, you can play a lot of that. You can play a man, you can play a woman because you're, you're, you're doing all the makeup and everything. But unless you're, um, um, Tilden who can play anything, I think man, woman, beast, she's so amazing that, uh, uh, but that's an unusual, that's unusual. Even, um, Billy Bob Thornton, who in Sling Blade, I could never recognize him. I've watched that movie a million times and I cannot see Billy Bob in there. This is sometimes a way for an actor to say, I can do this. You may think that I'm way Billy Bob, but let me show you how I can transform myself into someone you don't even recognize. And you're looking at it and you know it's me, but you don't see me in there. And that's where Sling Blade is such a great movie because the whole time you're sitting there trying to find him and you're not going to do it. It's just, he just does, he just does such a great performance and transforms himself so much. And it's, it's impressive. It's very, very impressive. So my point is this, that uh, I saw, I saw David Harbour and I was like, I can't watch this movie. I don't want to watch the slasher film. My husband's been wanting to see it because he loves to see actors stretch themselves. So we put this movie on and it turns out it is nothing of what I imagined it was. Because I don't like to read synopsises because I like to go without knowing. Very hard to do with Disney because they copy their own films, but I digress. Uh, and so finally we put this on because it was an Amazon Prime, uh, included with Amazon Prime, and we watched it. And it turned out to be unbelievable. It was so, so good. People have given it four and a half stars. I couldn't believe it. First of all, it doesn't really do what I thought it would do for David. It's very similar to Stranger Things character. It's just a different venue. And it because he's still rough and tumble, but the the thing that throws the monkey wrench into the whole thing is that he actually is Santa Claus. So Santa Claus uh gets tough and that's all I'm going to say in case you were afraid it was going to be a slasher film. Because the last thing we would want him to do is this this guy who terrorizes people and and now now violent night means it's a violent night. I will tell you that. So what does violent night actually mean? It means that if you liked films like Squid Games and you like films that are kind of like a comic book but they're live action. Like there's tons of blood, but it's silly. The other thing I can say is maybe Deadpool, where there's not, there's some cussing, but there's not a lot of cussing because he's Santa. But in Deadpool, there's a lot of cussing and there's a lot of violence, isn't there? And um, so if you're someone who violence is repulsive, even if it's a funny, because there is funny in Violent Nights, uh, I would say it's kind of, but it really feels like a comic book. It really feels like a comic book, but using live action people. So I don't know if you've seen a show called Robot Carnival. I really love anime, but way back in the day, and we're talking the 80s and the 90s, there was an animated film that I picked up from uh, going to Little Tokyo and putting on my laser disc machine called Robot Carnival. And it is amazing. It really didn't do well at the box office because it was so odd and weird. And the actual ending is shocking. What you're going to find about movies from Thailand, Taiwan, uh, Korea, and Japan, and many others, but this group in particularly, is they love let making you feel, which is what I like. I like being shocked. I like being, you know, at the end of a movie, I'm going, did they really do that? Not creepy, creepy, but just, whoa. And this is a, if you've not seen Robot Carnival, they just came out, I think a few years ago with a DVD of it. And it's amazing. It's been remastered. I did a lot of sculpting for it. I helped with some of the model kits that they did. And if I think about it, I'll pull a model kit from a company called StreamYard, where they actually did model kits for 
uh, segments of Robot Carnival. Super, super cool. Super, super amazing. And if I remember, I will show you next time. I'll talk about Robot Carnival. But Robot Carnival is an animated film where you know how they do those free frame, freeze frames where somebody does a punch and the character, the animated character goes like this and their face stretches really big and their eyes pop out of their head and, and blood drops come out all animation and not quite as graphic as Akira. I'm not really an Akira fan, but they also did Akira. They brought Akira to the big screen. Streamer did. Uh, but anyway, it's, you know, this, but it's all exaggerated and this, and it's all exaggerated because it's animation and it's in slow-mo. You know, and the blood comes out, whoa, you know, this is a uh, violent night, uh, but it's humans. It's, it's people, people, and uh, it doesn't stop. Violent night means it's a violent night. So uh, if you're not into violence, I would avoid this film entirely. But what I want you to really know is it's not a slasher film. Okay. It's not that it's got, uh, it's, it's got, it's, it's funny. It has some funny. Um, it has some, it's, it's, it's unusual and weird and odd. Um, they, I, I have to tell you right up my alley, so I will be owning it, but, uh, it just so much violence that it becomes comical. Okay. Uh, it did, you don't feel it like you feel when, um, one of the movies that's a little difficult for me to watch is RoboCop because the violence in RoboCop, when, um, they take out the officer, is too real for me. It's, it's, it's too hard to watch. Now, one of the reasons that is, is because they pre-screened it for, uh, those that be, that used to be the violence police. They were trying to get, keep from getting, um, I think it has an R rating and they wanted PG, but they couldn't get an, a, a PG rating at the time. That's when PG, R, X were really prevalent. I don't think they're so prevalent now, are they? In any case in films, they didn't want it to, to be an R because then other people wouldn't watch it. Uh, so they made them cut down the violent sequence in RoboCop when originally it went on. I have a director's cut of it because I prefer that one where the violence went on for so long, it became ridiculous. It became silly and ludicrous, if you can possibly believe that, if you've seen RoboCop. That sequence just went on for so long, it became ridiculous. And that was their goal, is to make it so it, so much that it the real became unreal, just ridiculous. But when they cut it, it became too real. So I always fast forward through that sequence because I can't. My body can't tolerate it. So isn't that weird? Like in Squid Games, there's a sequence with a doll that like zaps you or shoot she shoots you i guess if if she catches you she's a big baby doll it's squid games is like escher meets the five thing the five thousand fingers of dr t meets um i'm trying to think of the anime i like uh i don't know meets a game show and it's just so bizarre but there you go right <laughs> Forgive me. Remnants of yesterday, I'm afraid. So uh, this is why, um, you know, you don't watch a movie if it's too much. Like a lot of people were concerned about the movie Hacksaw Ridge, which was done by Mel Gibson. And um, he was the director and stuff. But the movie is so amazing. But the violence it opens with, which is real, is hard for people. When I told people it was my favorite movie of that season, um, they couldn't believe it, you know, because my sister, I remember sitting and watching it with my sister and she said, my God, you know, not only is this war violence, but it's, you don't like war and, and you're watching war violence. I said, you got to get to, you got to get through it. So once you get through it, you will know why this this movie is so good and so amazing and it's actually uh a movie based on a true story like for real so uh it's a really great film so just heads up caution 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 i can see that lot of, not a lot of people tuned in today because of this movie and it could have been just a repulsive thing right from the get-go that i'm discussing but i wanted to point it out to you if you're someone who loves um, you love David, 
but you didn't want to watch it because you didn't want to see David in this situation. It turns out to be a very, very sweet, heartfelt movie with a lot of violence. So now you've got to choose, you know, um, I like a film that has that has a good story, and sometimes that story includes violence. But uh, if it's a bad story, if it's not a cool story, and there are some slasher films that I like, but they're very few. I'm not into you know Last House on the Left and uh, Texas Chainsaw Murders. Just not into that stuff. But uh, in all fairness to you guys, I I'm going in full disclosure, I will tell you that there's a movie called Vault of Horror, and I think. It came out as Tales from the Crypt 2, but it's actually called Vault of Horror where men meet in a strange meeting area and tell stories about dreams that they had. And if you haven't seen this movie, this movie I think is from the 70s. It, you guys who are really big uh, uh, Doctor Who fans, Tom Baker plays an artist in it and it's so good. It's like my favorite one. It is one of my, it's a trilogy. They used to do these, not a trilogy, but it's one of those anthologies where each story is a different segment of the movie. There's another one, I think it's called Tales from the Hood that actually is also pretty good. Again, uh, it's an anthology of each person's, you know, it's it's a each person tells a story and they're put together in a movie. This was very popular. And um, I have several that I like. Tales of the Hood happens to be one of them. But Vault of Horror, which if you can't find it under Vault of Horror, they may have changed it to Tales of the Crypt 2 because that's a bigger, better selling title. But if you get the chance to see that one or you just want to fast forward to the end and watch Tom Baker's story, uh, he was so popular as a Doctor Who back in the day that, uh, and he's also in a Sinbad film that he does real well. Uh, that These are all in that time frame. Tom Baker as the Sinbad genie and Tom Baker, or the person with powers, and um, Doctor Who, he was there, and um, this character, and all of them are just, uh, he's really great. It's an artist. It really makes us think differently about self-portraits. So uh, uh, very impressive, really cool, quite interesting, um, and uh, it's a really good story. So if you get to see it, if you're someone who's into that sort of stuff, uh, feel free to talk to me because I am someone who loves films uh, from way back when. So this one, I love this actor and I was just nervous that I was going to not be able to get it out of my mind. Like John Lithgow, that, that, that if you love John Lithgow and you don't want to see him scarier than anything, uh, don't watch the second season of Dexter. Just my advice. Uh, Cause he's not scary. He's terrifying in that. I mean, you just will not believe how good he is. It's, it shows his ability for real, but so much sure. So much. So it frightened people. They, they frightened clients. Clients would not put him in a benevolent role because they were afraid that stigma of that creepy guy was on John Liskow a bit too long. That stench, he could not dust it off his shoulders. So these are the things that if you're out there and you're an actor, you need to you need to consider when it's going to be your shining face. You know? In fact, I, I heard about a young lady who talks about some actors who need to have advocates, actors across the board need advocates when they're doing scenes. Maybe it's a nude scene and they need to kind of get a hold of that. Or maybe it's a scene where they're playing roles that are unsavory, like murderers, rapists, etc. They have to make sure that it doesn't mess with that human being's head. Because you climb into that skin, sometimes it can be a little challenging on you as a human being. So they have people that are there that help make sure you're going to be okay with performing it. And so isn't that interesting to dig a little deeper into the actor because an actor just doesn't jump in and say, yeah, I can do it. You know, sometimes it really has an emotional uh, wear and tear on your, your, your delicate psyche. So it's nice to know that nowadays we have people that have been hired to help make sure you stay stable in your present mind while playing something a little, you know, something very uncool, you know, scary, scary, right? I'll bet you they, you know, um, when you're playing these, you know, you're recreating these murderers like Dahmer, you know, I'm sure he had someone, that actor, he did a great job as that character, but 
I'm sure he had someone on board where he could communicate with and keep the gentleness of who he is as a human being. So when he left that role, it he, he could wipe off that, that stigma, you know, it didn't stick to him like glue. It's a very interesting topic, isn't it? And this is the way I go. So I'm not just talking about the movie, but what the, uh, what this effect can have on you as a performer or an actor, you just got to know that if you're going to do it and climb into some of these characters, you may need help getting out. And um, because you, if you, if you really give part of yourself into it, sometimes it, it can be very hard on you. And um, so they have a job where you are the person that helps reach into that dark hole and pull you out and dust you off. Make sure you're okay. So in the case of Violent Nights, this is not the fact because actually David uh, Harbour doesn't play a bad character. He plays a very good character, but it's a very action. It's an action character. If I could describe this movie, it's Die Hard meets High Die Hard meets Home Alone with Santa Claus. Okay, so Violent Nights, tagline, Die Hard meets Home Alone with Santa Claus. Okay, it's a tagline. There's my tagline. Okay, so uh, if you find you want to check it out, do let me know what your thoughts are. We're going to go over and see what you say. But uh, there's the deal. Hi, Tim Gillette. How are you? Sorry I missed you last Wednesday. It was doctor day for me, and I was going to write you and tell you. Um, but uh, I went to see doctors, and then I went to see my parents. This is an ongoing occurrence with Terry Arden. Um, I have elderly parents, and uh, uh, they need my assistance right now. So that's kind of my job right now. I'm still doing my sculpting and my painting, and I want to come to you uh, as often as I can. And while I'm thinking about it, if you saw the pre-recorded video, which I do on Fridays now, I'm trying to, I'm working to, there is no try. I'm working on doing more recorded content. So you guys will get more, but I am in transition and like a website, it's always moving and fluxing and adjusting and morphing. So just breathe. You may not be a rock star overnight. I am not that person on YouTube. I have uh, a very uh, intimate following, but uh, I don't look at those numbers and concern myself with that too much. I just keep working with what will make me happy bringing to you. And one of the things that makes me happy, if I may confess it, is to talk to you about the philosophies in life and also how you can make a living doing what you love and also how to be a good human being. Because right now, there's too many out there that feel entitled. They don't use their signals while driving excessively fast. And the other day, I have to tell you, and it's very common, there's an accident that I saw that put the girl up on the curb, totaled her car, and the guy was gone because there are more hit and runs happening than I've ever seen before. This is entitlement behavior. I remember back in the day, there were hit and run accidents, but they were more rare that you could that being a human being a good human being means you stop and make sure that person's okay. How is it that so many can drive away and not seem to care about the status uh you know about how that person is at the accident that happened with you in it. You may not have caused it. You know, if you're one of these people who runs, but you still run. And that's just how do you do it? How do you live with yourself? I don't understand it. It is incomprehensible to me that you could drive away from somewhere that, that could be hurt, dying, or need help. It is a it is an anomaly to me, you know? So I'm seeing that a lot. I'm seeing um, people zipping in like they're a New York taxi cab and we're in California, uh, not using signals and then getting angry. Like the other day I did a signal look, signal, move over slowly. And a truck came out of a lane and came right up like he wanted to be in my trunk, flashing his lights because how dare I be in the lane that he wants to go fast in? And it wasn't the fast lane. And honestly, even if it was the fast lane, you coming in and going behind me when you could wait and go in front of me because you're speeding already. Why did you have to get behind me? 
you know, then you have to say to yourself, you're in this situation where some loser is behind you flashing his lights and getting angry. And you're saying to yourself, I'm going to stay here. Well, I had to stay there because I pulled into that lane to pass another car. So I have to simply say to myself, dude, you're going to have to wait. Be patient. Once I get around this car, I will get out of your way. Instead of getting angry and saying, how dare you? Let's fight. Which is another thing that happens is this road rage racing situation that I see often on the freeway. And the very first thing I do is get as far away from that as I can. Because in today's world, you just don't know what kind of a nut is behind the wheel. So why am I saying this? Because here I'd like you to exercise a phrase that Jim Rohn taught me, which was wait, see, which was wait three seconds before you go into an intersection. Let me repeat that. It's very important. Wait three seconds before going into an intersection. If we analyze that phrase, the obvious is when at an intersection, the light turns green, you, slow, you count to three. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, and then you proceed into the intersection, okay? Why? Because of a million reasons, someone going the other way may not be paying attention. I can tell you a dozen accidents I have been saved by using that phrase as the literal meaning. But it has other meanings as well. Wait three seconds before going into an intersection means if you're angry and you write an email, reread it. Wait three seconds and reread it before you send it because you cannot unsend. Regardless of it saying you can, not true. It's out there and can be very dangerous for you. So wait three seconds, reread it, make sure your intention is what you want. If not, rewrite it because an angry email um, is not great if it doesn't get your point across. So bring it down. Talk level, talk like, you know, don't be crazy. Get your, you want to get your point across. So don't attack. Okay. Just, you know, state your case. Okay. Also, it means that when you're on the road and someone is climbing into your trunk and flashing their lights like a crazy person, don't go off the handle. Take three seconds to breathe and to say, look, I did my signal. I'm passing that car, so if you'll be patient enough to let me get around that car, which is next to me, I will happily move over so you can go on your wild and crazy life, okay? But with calmness, okay? Stay in that Zen space. Write down, wait three seconds before getting in the intersection because it will save you so much, it will keep you from getting into certain conflicts where people seem to have fuses that don't exist. There is no length on their fuses nowadays. They get crazy. And so you never know what you're going to uh, encounter. So you may have to be the bigger person. Um, because there are people out there that have poisoned us. Um, we're talking about, you know, serial killers and murderers. <laughs> Forgive me. I'm going to have my tea again because I can see my voice is shifting. I don't know what it is that's trying to get me. I know what it's not. It's not COVID. But I know that, you know, something is trying to get me and it's because I'm relaxing. I have a lot of, there's been a lot of weight taken off me. Um, thanks to my sister. Um surprising enough. And, uh, just the simple, she's doing something very simple, but it really is making a big difference to me. And I'm so grateful to her. So thank you, Kathy. Uh, but, uh, it, it, it just, she's coming in on weekends and seeing my parents and it's taking the pressure off of me because, um, I was trying to do it all and you can't as a caregiver. Um, and I'm not really the caregiver right now, but I am the one that has to make sure things are following in an even keel for my family. So it was a lot of emotional strain and uh, it, just someone taking just that little bit off has, has been life-changing. So once you relax, you know, after having a very, very busy schedule, the illness will try and get you. And this one is definitely trying. So uh, forgive the sniffles, but uh, I don't know if it's allergies. I don't know if it's a cold. I don't know. So I'm hitting it with 
uh, I'm hitting it with a lot of um, things so that I don't get it. And uh, nothing is really bothering me except for an occasional need to blow my nose and a, um, my voice change. It's, I mean, my throat, my, my throat's no longer scratchy anymore. So I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. I, don't know what it is. I just know something's trying to get me. But, uh, but there you go. I hope you understand. Um, this is what the channel is about. If you want to get to more in depth and I'm going to start doing tutorials and things, I've been observing a lot of artists on YouTube and on their websites and stuff. I have some that I'm so impressed with, uh, that, uh, I want to see how they do it. I want to watch them with my husband and say, uh, here's how I want this to be different. I like what they're doing, but I want mine to be like this so that my husband has visual aids because as an artist, that's the way, the best way I work. So, um, so there it is, but, but stay tuned for those. I'll have some, some short lessons that I'll do here. And then I'll have some extremely, I'll have some longer, more detailed lessons, uh, puppets, drawing, painting, sculpting. And I know that, uh, you guys know about my sculpting. So let me just uh, shift over a little bit from slasher films and films are always something that I love. And I've been with Disney as an Imagineer since 2007, but I don't work in house. I'm the come here, come here, get away, get away Imagineer, meaning that I'm independent, but Disney brings me in when they need to catch up on stuff, really. I mean, I think that's the best way to say it. If you, if you're doing a new ride or attraction and there's a, a, a you're sculpting in a certain material um, and I'm really good. I'm well versed in many sculpting materials. And you want someone who works fast. I happen to be someone who works very fast. So they'll bring me in and they'll have me catch them up so they're on their time schedule if they've fallen behind. And then they'll say, Great, Terry, and put me back in the box, you know, kind of like those little, remember those? You pop up, you carve real fast, and then they down, 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 back, back, boop, 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 put you back on the shelf. That's kind of me. And that really works for me. I also do a lot of miniature sculptures. If you've watched my other channels or you Google me, you'll see that I do a lot of sculptures that are uh, smallish and um, they're called uh, uh, Disney impressions. And I, I sell them to people, um, people like you. Uh, I also have a Patreon page. So what I really want to do is to show you my Patreon page because um, it's important that one of the things as I start to think about semi-retirement, I don't really think an artist retires, but when you start to semi-retire, which means I want to travel more because my husband has retired, what is that, what is my life going to look? If I was going to do a painting of my life now, which I do a lot of stuff, what am I going to set aside in order to do what I want to do? And what is it that I want to continue? One of the things is this broadcasting. I think it helps you, you know, if you find it doesn't help you, you don't have to sit and watch the channel, but, uh, uh, I'm hoping that it will, and it will evolve. Like I said, like a website, it evolves, but patreon.com slash Terry Harden is where we get deeper into other subjects. We talk about all kinds of things, Lego and life and Disney and Warner Brothers and um, Snoopy and all kinds of stuff like that. We talk about characters, we talk about art, and we talk about non-art, and we talk about everything. Okay, we talk about all kinds of stuff. The other day we were talking about tiramisu. So uh, it's just what people want to talk about. I do a live Zoom uh, once a week. Sometimes it's on Monday nights for those of you who work, and sometimes it's early in the morning for people uh, not only that get up early, but also across the pond because I have a lot of followers in uh, other countries. So early in the morning works for them. And uh, so that's what it does. Once a week, we do a live Zoom call where we actually can have a conversation. And then the rest of it is like this live right now. And then I'm working on some content that will be pre recorded so you can see more. Um, retro, uh, flashback Friday was a little unusual and a little weird because that was something I did in my car when I was experimenting, um, when I was driving, if I could do it and pay attention and I didn't drive very far. I basically said I was going to a party, but when recording, I was kind of driving around my neighborhood. I don't know if you got that, but, uh, I was thinking of doing a podcast when many of you podcasters out there said, no, 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 that is a full-time job. You Terry don't need another full-time job. <laughs> so I stepped away from it, but I thought you'd like to see it because it may have helped. And on Fridays, it allows me to scoot out quickly after I've talked with the tribe 
here's where you find out about it. $5 a month, you can be a part of the tribe. So um, check it out if you will. There are other tiers that you can be involved in if you want to. Um, but I'm working on populating those better. So, you know, coming in at the $5, that was a perfect starter to see if you if it's even something you want to continue doing. But it's really great. Uh, and it's not great because of me, it's great because of the community that has decided to come together and be a part of the tribe. So I invite you to do that. Okay. Yeah. Come on down and join us. Basically it's, it's really fantastic. Um, and then, um, what else was I going to tell you? Oh, I'm also uh, a member of the chalk team. Uh, Children's Hospital of Orange County, C-H-O-C-I-E, Chalk, has uh, teams that get together and raise money for Children's Hospital of Orange County, Chalk, Children's Hospital of Orange County. Okay. <laughs> I don't mean to be so literal, but just in case you didn't know about it, uh, I will be a bit literal. And I would love, I'm going to do an auction at some point where, uh, and I will let you guys know, I'll post it to my page and, uh, you guys can, uh, be a part of that to help me raise money for children's hospital. I would love for you to participate and I'm willing to give you something cool. Uh, if you like it, you can bid on that and, um, highest, it will go to the highest bidder and all the money comes to chalk. So um, we'll do something like that uh, in within this next month. So um, I hope you will participate and I hope you will give generously. Um, maybe I'll just put up a page, a chalk page in my area so that you can donate to chalk and, uh, and uh, you know, I'll see what I can, you know, send out. I don't know. Anyway, it would be great if you donated is all I'm saying. Uh, and that's what I'm doing. This is my one charity. Well, I do a lot of charities. I like to do a lot of charities, but this is the one that I actually walk. And this year we get to walk. I have a great team called Mickey's walkers. And if you want to join that team, reach out to me. Okay. You can reach out to me here in this comment box, or you can private message me, message me, um, Google me, Terry Harden and find me and then email me if you want and ask me how you join because we'd love to have you on the team, which is really the most fun of all. Uh, this year, uh, the Chalk Walk is on August 20th. Um, if you join our team, it is recommended <laughs> that you, I mean, you can go to chalkwalk.org. And when you're looking for a participant, put in Terry Harden Jackson. That's me. Um, and you, you can donate directly if you'd like to. I'd appreciate it. Thank you in advance. Uh, but the reality of it is this. When you go there, if you see the picture that they put on display there, um, you got to see it. Because if you look over as you're facing your screen, it's over to the left. You will see a ton of Mickey's walkers. It says Mickey's OUAC walkers, but it's all us. So we are a very dynamic uh, uh inspirational team and uh we're in it to win it we have a fantastic leader and uh her name is sharon and uh, it's just a great group to be with so i highly encourage you to reach out if you want to be on the team maybe i'll put a link uh in my facebook thing but let's talk to you guys you're all here so you saw that uh tim said hello hi tim and i'm gonna try really hard to see you this wednesday i don't think i have anything I'm trying to keep that, our meeting free, but I get a curveball thrown. Um, last time I had to run and help my mother at the convalescent hospital because she gets a little aggressive with the nurses. So I had to come and save them. They needed to change sheets or something. And I'm the one that calms my mother down while they do the work. So you never know. It's never a dull moment. <laughs> but know that I'm thinking of you always. Uh What's interesting is that John Lithgow was one of the very first men to ever play a trans woman. Yes, it's true. Did a remarkable job, World According to Garp. Yes, and very vulnerable and sweet. Do you remember how your heart went out to him? He had this ability. In fact, many of his characters made you feel. You just, you just, you, you sympathized with them. You understood them. He kind of gave you a message without ramming down your throat, didn't they, Laura? Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. 
Oh, Terry, July 17, going to the park. You bet I'm there for the birthday. Already have my reservation. Whoop, whoop. Um, and that's a great time to come and meet the tribe, meet Terry's tribe. A lot of the people from my Patreon page will be there in spades. And uh, they're going to be, uh, we're going to be uh, having a great time. You can find me because I'm usually around, in and around Coke Corner. Uh, that way you can meet and greet me. Please step up. I hope I've made myself approachable to you and say hi. Yeah, for sure. Hello, Michael. Good morning. Hi, Diane. I know you're late, but you're always lovely. Thank you. How are you today? Today is my birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. As they say on TV, happy birthday to you. And forevermore, Mike. <laughs> Mine's on the 21st. And can you guess? Let me put my sleeve out. Can you guess how old I'm going to be? Here's a hint. <laughs> and look, Diane even said happy birthday to you. Oh, my goodness, goodness gracious. Wow. Well, everyone, that's the end of the comics ro comments road. And I know that this subject may or may not have been interesting to you, but I felt I had to say it because I was so surprised with Violent Night. I got to tell you, I just wanted to talk about it. Uh, uh, Friday, I'll have something wonderful and pre-recorded for you to chew on. And, uh, and then we'll talk next Monday. All right. Next Monday is going to be the, uh, isn't that going to be the 19th? And uh, I will be heading, I'll be hitting the road because I, I, I mean, I will be hitting the road. I will be celebrating my birthday. So uh, uh, it will give be the opportunity. My birthday is not the 19th, by the way. <laughs> but it'll be the day that I probably celebrate with my father, both Father's Day and my birthday. So um, here's hoping that uh, he's out of the hospital and doing better knock on wood. So, uh, guys, be well, be safe, do something nice for someone else. It'll make you feel a whole lot better. And why do I give this tagline? Because if you're starting to feel depressed and down and you get going down that dark, dark path where you're not feeling good about yourself, there's a way out by doing something nice for someone else. It absolutely will enwrap you with kindness. So how can you do it? And it doesn't necessarily involve money. A simple phone call or writing an actual letter. You remember those. Stationary paper, pretty envelope, stamp, and a return address, and the address. Send that to somebody because so many people do the Larson cards, the email cards. Those are wonderful. And it helps people remember dates and stuff. But when you actually send one to someone you haven't talked to in a while, it really touches their heart. And I tell you this because it keeps reminding yours truly, I should do it too. Okay? So uh, do something nice for someone else. It'll make you feel a whole lot better. Now, if you do have a couple of bucks to spare, donate to someone's charity, hint, hint, or... If you're in a Starbucks line, and I know many of you are, buy the coffee for the person behind you. It will make you feel good, even if that person doesn't know you're doing it. Even if your car has driven away and you're, you know, it's being human. And it will help you stay out of that depressive state that maybe some of you are in. And then finally, join Terry's tribe. Why? Because there's a group of people who are all about the becoming better human beings and helping each other to get to where they want to go in their goals in life. And when there is a challenge in their life, they can talk about it frankly and freely on a channel behind a closed door. So no one is judged and no one is dissed for it. You know what I'm talking about. If you say something on a public channel like a TikTok, a Twitter, or a Facebook, people can come down on you for it. They might get angry. Maybe you didn't mean it that way, or maybe you did. But behind a private door, we actually discuss how you're feeling and why you're feeling that way. Okay? Uh, <laughs> forgive me. How do my lights work, as they say in 12 Angry Men? 
He says summer colds are awful. Um, I need to take one more COVID test to make sure I didn't catch something. Uh, but uh, uh, I was doing great until I came home Saturday night. So I don't know what it is. But uh, in any case, whatever it is, however it is. And uh, I hope I felt good singing uh, the birthday song to Mike Pruitt. And uh, and uh, so hopefully he felt good when I sang that way. But if he didn't, I still did. Right. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Thank you, Mike. Uh, my parents are doing well. My dad is having a special autopsy today. So uh, I kind of appreciate that uh, we're ending now because he's supposed to uh, have it about now. So I can monitor my phone to make sure that they don't uh, need me to uh, chat with them or anything. So far, I haven't missed any important calls from the... Um, from the hospital. So I, pro I made the doctor promise me he would call me after and tell me how it went and, uh, my dad doing. So that's, what's happening to me today. Monday is always a busy day for Terry. So, uh, here we are busy day again, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm tickled. I'm tickled about it. And I always love talking to you. And I hope that what I'm doing here is doing something nice for you. If you have any questions or you have anything that you'd like me to touch on in these channels, it's Terry TV. So it can be in the news today, the first sunny day for a few days. And I'm upset about it because June gloom is my thing. I love it. Cool and cold and overcast. It's okay for me to say that in California because we have it so rarely. But this has been my year with a lot of great rain and now everything's green and beautiful and the flowers are killer wonderful and the weather's been great with a little breeze. I can get up early in the morning and it's overcast and my little dog runs around while I have a cup of coffee on my porch. It really is fantastic. So uh, uh, I want to share that with you to take that moment for yourself, a Zen moment, if you will. Um, you know, if you, if you're someone who the word meditation is kind of, you're kind of allergic to it, understand that meditation is a million different things. It's not necessarily that great pose in the lotus position saying nam ya ho renge kyo. That it's, it's not that it's about being quiet in a place of comfort for you. For me, it's my backyard. It could be listening to the fountain or watching birds or sketching birds. In my location, we have what's called a murder of crows. That's more than one crow, uh, a humorous for today, but that's it. So I like to sketch the murder, <laughs> the crow murder, which is a lot of crows kind of walking around my roof. Yesterday was fantastic because I wasn't feeling well. So I basically just wrapped myself up and watched the squirrels play because guys, it's May, June. So love is in the air. And uh, the squirrels were having a ball. They were running across the roof. They were playing in my rain gutter over my studio. So I opened the window so I could just watch them because it was a bit chilly for me to be outside when I was dealing with whatever this was. So I just had to give myself a giggle because uh, uh, they were bouncing up and down like that whack-a-mole. They were bouncing up and down in my rain gutter kind of teasing each other. And then finally they were trying to find a nice, lovely area where they could get it on, boom, boom, get it on, boom, boom. But unfortunately there were two other squirrels that wanted to be involved and an orgy wasn't these two squirrels thing. So comedy ensued. The point is, is that uh, it's a lovely place to just relax and meditate if you will be quiet and watch the animals play and be silly and be funny and goof around and the crows who then a raven comes in and the crows all dissipate. It's just nature can be so much fun. Yes. Um, I don't know. And then I'll leave you. I don't know if I told you about last year. Uh, I have a lot of lizards in my garden and I love reptiles as long as they're not rattlesnakes. Uh, and I, I love rattlesnakes too. I just don't want them too near me because they're so flippin' really lethal. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but I love reptiles and, uh, and, uh, lizards are some of my favorite. Uh, I especially love May and June because the lizards do their, their dance. 
you know, they see a beautiful female and they start to do their, their head bob dance, you know? And I, a couple of years ago, I had a rather large lizard that uh, really thought he was all that, you know, you could really see that he had the Barry White going on in his head when he'd get in front of the ladies and he'd really dance. And he couldn't understand why the ladies were all running away from him. Well, a bird had pooped on his head. Just a, you know, I don't know if you've seen that, that cow that has a bird and then the poop is kind of, you know, the, the poop is running down his face. And on a big animal like that, I guess it doesn't matter. But on a little animal, it was on all over his little his little head. So uh, I tried to, to help him out because the girls would see the bird poop on him and that was not an attractive look. So uh, I kept praying that he would finally get it washed off before uh, mating seating was, was gone. But uh, he was really so funny as he, he went through the dance and they would go and run away. <laughs> but he's been one of my, my favorite favorite characters of all time. Um, he just was so sweet. And I think I did sketches of him because he was so adorable. So anyway, I was saying goodbye. Uh, let me finish by saying goodbye, but let's, uh, Hey there, sorry, I'm late. I was making a list of Kurt Russell movies. See Joe Penny is a film person just like myself. Um, got my new Facebook group activated. Congratulations, retro classic, uh, movie goers. If anyone's interested in classic movies, I am. So send me the link, Joe, please. Uh, I love May Gray and June Gloom too. Yes, Diane. Um, we're going to get warm enough and absolutely hot in plenty of time. So I revel in my June Gloom. Today we have uh, we have the sun out. So my dog is going to be really happy because she's kind of like, uh, what did you do with the sun, mom? So uh, I'll be sitting on the porch allowing her to sunbathe a bit since it's been away. I'll give her that gift and I know the gloom will return to me soon. So uh, Joe says, I finally saw Avatar The Way of Water. HBO said, it was really good. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Five stars. Well, that's great, Joe. Uh, 3D would have been an interesting enhancement, but it holds its own in 2D. Very nicely. Good movie. Yeah, Joe, I highly recommend now that you know you love it, of seeing to catch it in the theater uh, and sit like uh, ideal row. I went to a, a screening at the Academy Theater. Ideal row, my husband said, was row. I was in row. What row were we in? One, two, three. I think we were in row five. And I think row row seven or eight is the ideal row to be in center to experience the way Avatar is supposed to be experienced. And uh, you won't believe it. It completely comes and like brings you into the movie. And I think you'd really enjoy it now that you know you love it. I highly recommend that maybe you try and catch it at a theater. We did see it in 3D. Um, we didn't have to wear glasses or anything because now I, I guess it's a whole different animal. So I don't know if you have to or whatever. Anyway, it was really beautiful. Um, Cameron talked about it afterwards. It was one of those where, you know, all the cast and everybody talk about it, what it was to make it and what it was like and how an editor actually has to cut together two films the live action film and then the animated film involving the, yeah, it's, it's, it's very complicated. So if you loved it, then I highly recommend you go in the theater and see it sit around the eighth or ninth row. You'll be blown away. My husband, my husband's one of those people that he doesn't really care where I sit as long as it's not right in front, Ugh! which I did for Pinocchio. I digress. Uh, and uh, uh, he said, I think row eight or nine, and we couldn't sit there because that was reserved. So bingo, that was the row because it was probably for people who were going to decide whether or not it was going to be judged. Well, it was up for an Academy Award, obviously. So that was probably for people who could make that happen. You know, you reserve that when you're doing that for the movies. Anyway, it was it was it, where we were. He said this is the second best, which was like fifth or sixth row. I wanted to be close because I wanted to. If they were going to have a QA, and a I wanted to be able to ask a question, which they didn't have. Black Academy doesn't usually do that, but uh, I was, I always hope. So uh, just, just a tip for you, because I loved it too. I thought it was a lot of fun. <laughs> LOL, poop on lizard. I love lizards too. I call their dance push-ups. Diane, it looks just like he was pushing up, except for mine was, this, this giant lizard was, you know, the swing push-up, you know. Little head jog, you know. He was adorable. He was absolutely adorable. Problem is, when I pulled the camera out to videotape him, he was very shy. Especially when you have bird poop on your head. I guess this is not funny. So uh, so there you go. All right, my loves. Be well. Be safe. You know what I'm going to say. Do something nice for someone else. It'll make you feel a whole lot better. 
I will see you next Monday. Love, kisses, have a lovely week, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for being here. Bye for now.